This is Cape Cod Bay. We're on the Dennis Shore, which is the south side of the Cape Cod Bay. And our destination is the shoreline off of the town of East Ham in Orleans. Bill Emeru has been fishing the waters off Cape Cod since he was a boy. And for more than 50 years, he's been making his living as a commercial fisherman. Today, Amru and longtime friend Jim Gilrain are in search of scallops. Scallops are the most valuable catch in New England, and Amaru is hoping that this dredge will scoop up big numbers. In Massachusetts, the fishing industry generates nearly $22 billion in sales each year and provides more than 200,000 jobs. For Amaru, fishing is a family affair. He captains this boat, the Paladin, and his son Jason also fishes these waters. His grandson wants to follow in their footsteps. But these days, Amaru worries he won't be able to carry on the family business. I say to myself, God, find something else to do. It's just going to be such a struggle. This trip is also turning out to be a struggle. The dredge is catching more seaweed than scallops, and each haul is burning money. According to Amaru, his costs, including insurance, fuel, and maintenance, have tripled in the last two decades. But the price he gets for his catch has stayed the same. Here are these things here, these are all too small. But there's something even more troubling than the rising costs that threaten the whole fishing industry, climate change. Warming waters pushing species like lobster up north and into colder regions. We have things changing in the ocean due to global warming that are, that are catastrophic uh, in m many cases on, on our traditional fish stocks. The more that time goes by and the more that we disrupt the climate, uh, the more that these things are happening and it's, it's making it very difficult to make a living on the traditional stocks. In fact, if I went today, tried to make a living the way I did in the 70s, 80s and 90s, I would not even make enough to pay for my fuel bill. It's simply, they, the fish just are not here anymore like they were back then. To understand what's happening to the fish here, you have to understand what is happening to the ocean all along New England. Climate change is drastically affecting the continental shelf and slope in the Northwest Atlantic, particularly south of New England. One of the most noticeable features in studying the continental shelf in particular is the warming. And that's really occurring on two time scales. So there's the long, steady warming there that we've studied, and that's occurred over, over decades there. But there's also shorter term events that are called marine heat waves. And they are particularly important because we've seen instances where it may be 12 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than usual for weeks or even months. The continental shelf is a wide, relatively shallow area that extends far offshore to the boundary of the deep ocean. Along the shelf runs the Gulf Stream, a strong ocean current that brings warm water from the south up the east coast and into Canada. According to scientists from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, over the last two decades, the Gulf Stream has warmed faster than the global ocean. It has also shifted closer to the coast. What we've seen, in, particularly since 2020, Gulf Stream water masses tens of miles inshore of the edge of the continental shelf now. This enhanced exchange is, is certainly contributing to what's called the tropicalization of the New England shelf there. Warming ocean waters threatening traditional stocks like these scallops. The scallops have a, a maximum temperature that they can survive, and as Gulf Stream water increasingly comes onto the continental shelf, there can be increased mortality just due to temperature increases. When he's not fishing, Bill Amaru helps his son Jason with his boat. They're fixing nets, detangling wire and removing rips before a two-day trip out to sea. Like his father, Jason is finding it harder to make ends meet. The fish he is licensed to catch are moving away, and the industry is tightly regulated. Observers from the Fishery Management Service go out on each trip to monitor the catch. Amaru says he pays between $700 and $900 for the observers, sometimes more than what he brings home. The Fishery Service puts 100% observer coverage on ground fish trips like this, 
So in, in the future, if you choose to take uh, electronic monitoring instead of a physical observer, you have these cameras here. So they can see every single thing that we catch and discard and uh, make sure that our accounting is correct. So these cameras are new, I just got them on. But why don't the Amaroos just catch the new fish, like black sea bass, that are coming in from the south? The Amaru says a system of quotas and regulations designed to protect from overfishing has become too rigid and too slow to keep up with the pace of climate change. You know, the cod that I used to catch in the blackback or winter flounder, they're now up in Canada, in Canadian waters, making the fishermen up there very happy. And ours are, are from the mid-Atlantic, from off the coasts of Maryland and Virginia, North Carolina, and they're up here. So now these fish are available to you, and you go out and you catch them. But the quota says, Bill Amaru, you don't have a quota for summer flounder or fluke. I have to put them back in the water. Can't bring them in. Yeah, go the other way. All good this morning? Before quotas, fishers could catch what they wanted and as much as they wanted. But by the 1950s and 60s, cod, flounder, haddock, and other stocks were showing signs of stress and extreme overfishing. In the 1970s, Congress passed a law intended to protect and rebuild fish stocks. Known as the Magnuson-Stevens Act, it created quotas that limit how much fishers can catch. The quota system is managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. These catch limits are set based on scientific fish surveys and recommendations from the local fishery management council. I'm going to give a, an overview. We've done this a couple of times already as a full council. We set overview of regulations and, and management measures that are designed to ensure that we can maintain healthy populations of fish, but also um, maintain healthy fishing communities. Council process is purposefully and deliberately slow and cumbersome. Um, it is designed to be a giant public forum for input, but that makes things um, that makes things slow moving. And it, the, the rate of change we're seeing on climate related environmental drivers, our process might not be nimble enough, might not be responsive enough. Um, and we need to consider ways that we can be more effective, more efficient. Gotta get it. Can't let it spin. I, I got you. Fishers like Bill Amaru say that the quotas are set based on surveys that are too slow or inaccurate. The surveys count fish years in advance, but with the climate changing so quickly, Amaru says that those numbers don't always reflect what is actually in the water today. We don't have time. Uh, we're already at the point now where we're barely hanging on. Uh, very low value fish like skates and dogfish are, are the primary catch. In fact, they're the only catch really existing in Chatham anymore. It used to be 98% of what we caught was cod. The pressure to create new opportunities is real. We can't wait a decade um, because there won't be New England fishing industries left anymore if, we, if this goes on too long. O'Keefe says that the Management Council and NOAA are looking at creating flexibility for fishers. One idea is to grant permit suites that would cover more species rather than a single fish. The council is also looking at ways to let fishers catch what is actually in the water on the days they go out to sea. But none of these ideas are yet reality. Closer to shore, another problem is threatening the water and organisms that live there. Decades of man-made pollution have devastated bays and estuaries. The, the animals will not live in that polluted water. According to the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, an environmental watchdog group, 90% of the area's bays and ponds needed restoration work as of 2023. The cause? Nitrogen leaking from septic tanks and into the water. The nitrogen causes massive algae blooms that suffocate other plant and animal life. Amaru says he has not fished close to the shore in the last four decades. But for scientists like Mirta Teichberg at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, this problem may be fixable, or at least improved. Her solution involves restoring an aquatic plant called eelgrass, the dominant species of seagrass in New England. Okay, look at that. So we have here our first seagrass. Blades. These ones are the non the yeah, this non, is non So eelgrass is actually really important habitat for many fishes as well um, as invertebrates. Just from an ecosystem perspective, you have a larger biodiversity of organisms that are growing uh, in seagrass meadows. 
Um, so the these organisms can hide in the seagrass and, you know, protect themselves against predation. This uh, this is West Falmouth Harbor and where where the harbor goes more in to the inside, we've had a lot of nutrient loading and so we've had disappearance of seagrass meadows. And so what we're actually trying to do is monitor the system over time and see how the meadows have changed, look at the coverage of the seagrass meadow as well as the water quality. And we're hoping to see uh, improvements in water quality uh, over time. Eelgrass also take up carbon dioxide in the water and produce oxygen for other plants and animals. And importantly, they protect the coastline from waves and storm surges. But since the 1800s, seagrass has declined by 30% worldwide, and Massachusetts has lost half of its eelgrass in the last two decades. The major threat has been and still tends to be um, water clarity or water quality and development, um, poorly traded sewage, urban runoff, um, all those things contribute to uh, increasing turbidity and reducing light penetration into the water. And so, like any plant, um, they, it needs light to photosynthesize and survive. Don't try that at home. Phil Calaruso is a scientist at the Environmental Protection Agency. He's been studying eelgrass for more than 35 years. And like Tageberg, he's working to bring eelgrass back to the area. There are two main ways to restore eelgrass. One is to transport and replant eelgrass shoots. This process is costly and labor intensive, and it is not foolproof. Eelgrass from one area may not thrive in another, or a storm could wash a newly planted bed away completely. So the first site, we're actually going to now siphon out the seeds from West Falmouth Harbor. Tageberg's team is focusing on eelgrass seeds, regrowing beds by broadcasting or throwing massive numbers of seeds into the water. But the hard part is finding and developing seeds that will grow in warming climates. We're collecting seeds. We bring them back to the laboratory. Uh, we are then allowing those seeds to mature in the lab. We can test also how they'll do under different light conditions or how they'll do with increased temperature, which are some of the main stressors that uh, these seagrasses are being exposed to. So I think that's our biggest challenge with seed-based restoration is um, collecting enough seeds to actually make it work. All right, so I'll start collecting reproductive shoots, and then when I have a handful, I'll just bring them to the boat. Yeah. Tageberg says that only 10 to 30 percent of all seeds will germinate. Their success hinges on many factors, including water quality. But it will take Cape Cod decades to reduce the flow of nitrogen into the groundwater, and climate change continues to be a threat. Warmer waters reduce the chance the new eelgrass plants will survive. But if Tageberg and other scientists can regrow eelgrass to historic levels, beaches and ponds would be cleaner, and fish could once again become abundant closer to shore. Back on the Paladin, Bill Amru is catching flounder, but mostly he and his crew are finding dogfish, a thriving species that gets almost nothing at the market. There aren't very many people fishing for a living. Never had been, but there's a lot less now than there used to be. It's a small part of our, of our culture, but a very important part, because it represented a uh, uh, an individual willing to take on nature, willing to endure the risks involved with going to sea, which is an inhospitable environment at best. There's potential that uh, it could be lost and uh, who knows what other implications could be uh, coming along with it. <laughs> 